Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. Thank you. Riley, you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and now you want to follow him in baptism. She's saying yes. So Riley, because of your profession of faith in Christ, I baptize you now, my little sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I raise you to walk in the newness of life. The waters are ready. Who will be next? The title of my message today is What to Do When You Have Lost Your Cutting Edge. I'm going to begin a series of sermons this morning, not a Bible book study as I uh, normally do, but I'm going to begin a series of sermons called Lost and Found. You know, the scripture is chock full of stories of lost and found. There are things that were lost that were found. There were people that were lost and found and animals that were lost and found. And all of those lost and found stories have profound spiritual significance. So for the next few weeks, we're going to look at lost and found. Today, we have the story of the floating axe head from 2 Kings chapter 6 verses 1 through 7. I want to speak to you about a man who lost an important object but by way of a miracle he got it back. What if a person, what if an individual losing, loses something or fails for no apparent reason? What if a person is living life responsibly and loses something or fails at something? What if a person stumbles at no fault of his or her own or no fault of anyone else? Have you ever heard of a no-fault car crash? Think about that. A no-fault car crash. I was in one a couple of years ago. Uh, as I've told you, my goal is to get a speeding ticket in all 50 states but I was actually behaving on a day, driving through Alabama, and a woman behind me, uh, quite a bit older than I, driving at a high rate of speed, ran into the back of my car. Knocked me out of control. I was able to, to, to pull the car under control, move to the shoulder of the road, and we waited on the police to come. She hit me from behind, but the police report said no fault, and it had our speeds listed. It had my speed listed as 55 miles per hour, and her speed listed as 45 miles per hour. But she hit me from behind. I don't know what that was about, but it was declared a no fault accident. Well, we have no fault accidents. It doesn't seem to make much sense, but it's been determined that it just happened. I believe that there are times when people fail or times when people lose things not because of any obvious sin or problem. What do we do in those situations? So this morning I'm going to tell you about, about a man who is virtually unknown in the Bible. He doesn't have a name that we know of. I'm going to call him the man and the woodcutter. That's how we know him. First time I heard about the axe head that floated was when I was at summer camp as a teenager. I've only heard one sermon about this man and his situation. So I hope your curiosity is aroused by now. There are seven points to today's message and all of them follow the sequence of events. First, the man lost his cutting edge. Second, the man admitted his loss. Next, he let the prophet help him. 
Next, his main concern was that his cutting edge was borrowed. Next, no one blamed anyone for the loss. Next, to find his cutting edge, he returned to the place where he lost it. And last, for his cutting edge to be restored, he had to reach out and take it back. Will you read with me from 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning with, verses, beginning with verse 1. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place for us to meet. And he, meaning Elisha, said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha said, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it, threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. The man reached out his hand and took it. This man lost his cutting edge. The scripture tells us, as one of them was cutting down a tree, an iron axe head fell into the water. At the edge of the Jordan River, men were cutting down trees to build a, a new place of worship, a new place to meet with the prophet Elisha who followed Elijah. The only way an axe head would have gone into the water would have been if it came loose from the axe handle. A woodcutter must watch his axe closely to make sure that it's securely fastened to the handle. How many of you have chopped wood? I have several times. I've chopped enough wood to know that I don't want to chop it anymore. And on the eighth day, God created chainsaws. <laughs> but uh, an axe has to be maintained. Notice that the scripture says, as one of them was cutting down a tree, Apparently, the man was working so hard that he did not realize he was about to lose his cutting edge. I want you to remember that because I think that's good. The Bible narratives, as you know, don't hold back when somebody had a moral failure or an ethical failure. We know the good, bad, and ugly of people in the Bible. We know about the failures of Joseph and David's failures, Saul's failures, Solomon, just to name a few. And in this case, we have no descriptors of this man's character. Along with his name, we don't know anything about his character. There's no indication of personal failure, no moral failure, no ethical failure. All we have is that he was working when his axe head fell into the water. I want you to notice that he lost it while he was doing his job. He didn't lose it while he was on break. He wasn't neglecting anything. He was merely doing his job. It's possible. Here's the application. It is possible for us to lose our cutting edge if we are not careful. We can become so engrossed in our work that we don't realize we're about to fail. We can become so engrossed in our work that we don't realize that we are about to lose our number one asset. Failure can creep up ever so slightly that we don't see it coming. We must be mindful to take care of our best asset, whatever that might be. Next, the man admitted his loss. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out. That was his admission of loss. And it's important that the man admitted his loss and that he did it suddenly. He did not live in denial. He did not try to fake it. He did not lie about it. He did not say someone stole it. He didn't blame the water, the weather, or being distracted by President Trump's tweets. He took the blame. He admitted the loss. Most of us don't like to admit it when we lose something, do we? 
We don't like to admit it. We cringe at the thought of criticism, so while we search for what we've lost in silence, we act as if there has been no loss. Right? Husbands, wives, you know what I'm talking about here. I've done it. The truth is, you can fake your loss, but you can't fake it for very long. My number one ongoing loss is car keys. If heaven, I don't care what the weather's like in heaven, as long as we don't have to have keys in heaven, I'll be okay. I can only fake the loss for so long because eventually I have to drive. And I humbly ask, can, can y'all help me find my keys? And our number one finder is Matt, who has eagle eyes, and he's gone to college. So I think I'm just going to leave all my keys in the cars and just make sure our insurance stays paid in case somebody wants to take a drive. But how many of us are quick to admit our loss like this woodcutter was? It's important for us to admit when we feel that we're losing our cutting edge. Living in denial and faking it, neither one of those are fun, neither one of those, all of those require lots of energy. Is there a place where you've lost your cutting edge? Do you find yourself slacking in your work? Do you find yourself being satisfied with mediocrity? If so, it's best to admit, I've lost my cutting edge. Well, we don't have to stop there. Look what the woodcutter did next. He let the prophet help him. Where did it fall, the prophet asked. Since the man was honest enough, and since he was humble enough to admit his loss, he was in a good place to receive help. And since we know the rest of the story, we know that he received the help he needed. Listen to the application. We can only get help when we admit loss. The only thing that keeps us from admitting loss is pride. In the past, I worked with a few people who did not value professional development. They just liked being in charge and bossing people around. They felt that they themselves were the epitomes of professional development. They never attended conferences. They never read new books about their occupations, yet they expected their employees to do so. And while they thought their work was quality, everyone around them knew that it was not. I've told this church staff, I expect all of them to be subject matter experts in their respective areas of ministry. And if they need help, they need to ask. As your pastor, some of you know I ask for help all the time. I want my ax to be sharp and cut well. And I know that I can't do it alone. I've called on some of our own church members to ask their thoughts on certain scriptures. And some of you have been gracious enough to to write down your thoughts and hand those to me. Some of you have been gracious enough to take notes from radio and TV preachers and hand them to me. I really appreciate that a whole lot. I've got a small group of pastor friends that I can share ideas with and I can get their input. I'm regularly at a loss for answers. I'm at a loss for new material. I'm at, I'm at a loss for insight on how to do things, and I ask for help all the time. It keeps me busy. I'm just being honest with you. I don't have all the answers. You know, there's no secrets to pastoring a church. It's just hard work. And many pastors may do it better and more independently than I, but as you know, I continually ask for help. I try not to do it on Sunday mornings in the hallways because I don't want anybody to dodge me. Here comes Brother Paul. He's going to ask me for something, so I'm going to ignore it. When you admit your loss, you need to get help, whatever that help may be. Next, the man's concern was that his cutting edge was borrowed. That was his main concern. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. What an odd thing to say. Oh no, my Lord, 
I'm going to lose my job. He didn't say that. Oh no, my Lord, I'm so embarrassed. I was careless or whatever. He said, it was borrowed. The woodcutter in the story represents the best possible steward. He was more concerned that the, ex, that the axe head was borrowed than he was about what others thought about him, what others thought about him losing his job or anything else. Perhaps this woodcutter was too poor to own his own axe. Perhaps he left his home without his axe and had to borrow one. Whatever the reason, he had a borrowed axe, we do not know. But his main concern was not for himself and his own livelihood. His main concern was that he lost something that was borrowed and he felt terrible about it. Why? Because he was going to let the owner down. I want to borrow a phrase from a radio commentator you've heard me quote before, talent on loan from God. You know, that's who, that's who you are. You and I, we are talent on loan from God. All of our gifts, skills, talents, all of them are God's. He distributes them as he pleases. The question is, are we being good stewards of what he has given us? If you feel you've lost your cutting edge, you should be concerned because it was never really yours in the first place. Next, no one blamed anyone for the loss. Wow. What a, what a headline. No one blamed anyone today. There's no scripture reference for this point because there's nothing in the scripture about blaming, but I wanted to point this out to you. <clears throat> the woodcutter didn't blame anyone for his loss. And the prophet did not blame the man either. If their story had been on Facebook today, the blaming post would go. Dumb lumberjack. Doesn't he know how to keep up with his axe? Someone else would say, hey, what kind of prophet doesn't confront a man on his clumsiness? As you know, the prophets were pretty good at confronting people. During a time of crisis and loss, it's so easy to play the blame game, isn't it? It's so easy to point the finger. And this past week, I heard news that I didn't believe when I first heard it. I heard that the Lakewood Church in Houston, where Joel Osteen was a pastor, was closed to hurricane victims. The criticisms and the fingers started pointing, and only later we found out that they were co cooperating with the authorities from the very beginning. In our story, the woodcutter knew that the loss was his fault. The prophet didn't have to remind him. Instead, the prophet helped him. And in this brief story, we see that they did not waste precious time blaming each other. Folks, listen to me this morning. When someone fails, it is so easy to point fingers and to speculate why that person failed. When somebody loses something, it's so easy to scold. Be careful because you're going to lose something. And the person you scold for their loss will end up being the person helping you find what you've lost. Trust me. If a person has moral or financial failure, it might not be too difficult to figure out why they failed. But then there are other people like Job who had his struggles, Job in the Bible, and his own friends came to him and gave their reasons for his struggles. When you've lost your cutting edge, don't blame others. Admit it. Ask for help. If you're the one who is asked to help, do your best to refrain from blame. Just be helpful. Next, to find his cutting edge, the man returned to the place where he lost it. Verse 6 says, the man of God asked, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the axe head float. Very interesting. Two objects that have completely different properties, opposite properties. The axe head that's heavy, the stick that floats. Elisha took the stick, threw it in the water where the man pointed and the axe head floated. It happened so quickly 
that the man no doubt knew exactly where he lost it. If time had passed, if he had traveled some, it might have been more difficult for him to find the place where he had lost his cutting edge. If you feel that you're losing your cutting edge, you need to return to the place where you lost it and try to recount what happened. Try to recount where you got distracted and how you got distracted and how you neglected to take care of your number one asset. Like the man in the story, probably when you've had a loss, there was no moral or ethical reasons for it. It just happened. Maybe you were just working too hard. Maybe you were taking on more and more responsibilities, focusing on more projects and more deadlines. Metaphorically speaking, you were cutting tree after tree after tree without taking time to pause and sharpen your blade. And then all of a sudden it dawned on you that you'd lost your cutting edge. If so, return to the place where you lost it and seek to regain it. It might take a miracle, just like we saw in this story. In your mind, go back to the beginning of your life's work. Go back to the beginning of your volunteerism, your marriage. Go back to the beginning of your schooling and try to recall what was it that inspired you? What was it that just filled you with so much passion you took that route? Try to recapture it and dream again. But this time, dream a new dream. One that excites you more than the first dream. I believe that's possible. I talked to a man who worked uh, in our Tennessee Baptist Convention. And he's worked several jobs throughout his life in ministry. All of them have been completely different jobs. He's satisfied doing what he's doing now, believes he's right where the Lord wants him to be. And I asked him about this one day. And he said, well, every few years, I feel the need to reinvent myself and make myself relevant for a new day. That's pretty powerful. That's, uh, that's good advice from an older minister coming to a younger guy. Listen to this. For the wood cutters cutting edge to be restored, he had to reach out and take it back. Lift it out, the prophet said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. Folks, aren't you glad we serve a God of second chance? The woodcutter had a second chance. He could go to work again. Notice, he had to reach out and take it. It wasn't handed to him. And an iron axe without a handle is useless. So, this scripture implies that he had to take the axe head and put it back on the axe handle. It wasn't handed to him. If you get a second chance at anything, you'll have to put your own effort into your own restoration. You will have to put your own effort into your own second chance. Second opportunities don't come all the time. Sometimes we miss the first opportunity altogether. Sometimes we take the opportunity because it looks good and we feel that it's the right thing to do. We may lose that opportunity and we may pray and ask God, can I have that opportunity back again? If he provides it, you have to be a part of it. He is not going to hand it to you on a silver platter. He'll hand it out and you'll have to reach out and take it. We know all too well that People who go to drug and alcohol rehab must want to change. A court-ordered drug and alcohol rehab has absolutely no value whatsoever unless the person involved wants to change. Amen? Anytime any of us get a second chance, we have to be completely dedicated to that second chance, whatever it might be. I hope the message to you today was clear. We have a God of second chances, second opportunities. All of us have blown it the first time. 
All of us, because of our sinful nature, need to be saved. We all need that second opportunity, and it's offered to everyone whosoever will may come. Won't you trust Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Let's bow our heads for a prayer, and then we'll have our invitation hymn. Heavenly Father, I come to you today thinking about people here who do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, thinking of people who are listening by TV or radio or some other means. They've heard this message, and they know that they need a second opportunity as well. Lord, we know that our Adamic nature condemns us, but we know that the nature of Jesus Christ lifts us up. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to the movement of your spirit during our altar call time. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together. If you want to come forward to be saved, please come forward. If you've already made a decision or you want to affiliate with us, or you want to come forward to ask for a prayer for healing or whatever, we'll be waiting down front.